Hi. In today's video, we're going to be having a look at these power supplies. These are from the brand Juntec, and they sent these through for us to have a little look at in this video. So what we've got are two power supply modules. Uh, this one in particular is a bit of a monster. This is the Juntec DPM8650, and this is a 60 volt, 50 amp power supply unit. And this one on the right hand side is the DPH8920, which is a 96 volt, 20 amp power supply. Now, unfortunately, these don't accept an AC input, so you do have to provide them with an external power supply. And actually, I found it a little bit difficult to find anything that would make the full use of this power supply on the right. Uh, you know, something that outputs 100 volts or something like that at 20 amps is certainly quite a big AC to DC power converter and also quite expensive. So I'm not really sure exactly what the purpose for these is. Uh, I could imagine maybe if you had some kind of solar setup with batteries, you could use these to set up a sort of permanent or semi-permanent um, power supply unit or something like that. I don't think they're quite suitable for benchtop use. You certainly wouldn't want to be fiddling around with the settings uh, for your electronic circuits. I think it's for slightly higher power usage. So maybe if you were trying to drive some big motors or something like that, I could see maybe it would make sense then. But you do need an external power supply. And, um, you know, you might need to spend quite a bit of money. I was having a look at some power supplies for these. So uh, there's a Meanwell power supply that would output 100 volts. But that was coming in at about £300. So really quite expensive to make the full use of one of these uh, if you wanted to use it day to day. So I think these are sort of for semi-permanent fix fixtures. Um, but they are quite interesting devices. So they're basically adjustable buck regulators. You can set it to constant voltage or constant current modes. And these ones also have a couple of different communications interfaces. So they've got RS-485. And it also supports Modbus, I think. So if you want to use it for your industrial control, you can do. But they also both have wireless interfaces. And they've provided this little uh, wireless control panel, which is a little bit more user-friendly in terms of its setup and being able to set the voltages and that kind of thing. So the construction on these two is fairly similar. The front panel on both lifts off. And then the actual sort of display board is just mounted to the front panel. And this has one of those... Titan Micro TM1638 LED driver chip. So we just feed in serial to this and that interfaces with the buttons and also the seven segment displays. All right, so just looking a little bit at the construction, it doesn't look too bad at all. Um, we've got a really big chunky input and output terminals. These are, you know, really big. They could accept probably uh, at least six millimeter squared cable. So uh, certainly suitable for the job. Got some big chunky electrolytic capacitors. These are rated at 100 volts at 2200 microfarads. We've just got the one on the input and two of those on the output terminals. Mounted on the heatsink, we've got a couple of MOSFETs and a couple of dual diodes. These MOSFETs are real beasts. They're international rectifier RFP 4110s, and these are rated for 100 volts at 120 amps each. So two of those in parallel giving us lots of switching capability. And then we've got our two big inductors which are obviously for the book regulation. Then we've got a little STM32 which is actually the brains behind the beast and this looks to be like a 24L01 uh, 2.4 gigahertz wireless interface although it just has a blob here instead of the chip. Uh, but I think this is just what's providing the communications to our little handheld unit. Other than that, there's not a huge amount on here. Unfortunately, all of the other parts have had their names lasered off, so we can't work out what any of these are. But it's uh, pretty safe to say that we're going to have, uh, for example, some gate drivers for driving the gates on those MOSFETs. We've got a little bit of circuitry here, and this is our isolated... A bit of electronics to provide us with our RS-485 interface. So we've got a transformer here, which is giving a full isolated uh, supply voltage for the RS-485 interface. You can see we've got our optocoupler here, which is providing the actual serial interface. Uh, and it looks like this is the switch mode power supply chip, which is dealing with that. And then we've got an RS-485 transceiver. We've got another DC to DC converter here. 
The name is lasered off, but it's pretty clear that this is basically the DC to DC converter for providing the logic supply for all of the electronics on the board. Because uh, with this thing accepting uh, sort of up to, I think it's 70 volts on the input terminals, we can't feed our electronics just with linear regulators or anything like that because uh, it would dissipate too much as heat. So this is a little DC to DC converter for providing our logic supplies. And then there's not really a great deal else on here. We've got a programming header for the STM32. There's this little riser board and there just appears to be a little SOT23 device and two resistors. So I think this is the identification so that the microcontroller knows which configuration of the power supply this actually is. On the underside, there's not really anything on there. Some big tracers from the diodes and the MOSFETs, and these have got a bit of solder on there to increase the current carrying capability. The heatsink is screwed down to the board, and I think that's about all it is. You can tell it's lead-free, uh, you know, not got our shiny joints. Um, yeah, I think... Um, they're probably not using the finest lead-free solder based on the way that it's looking, but it's about as good as you're going to get, I think, for uh, the price. The smaller unit, the 90 volt version, is a little bit more compact and actually looks a little bit cleaner in terms of the layout and also the finish. But I think that's just because um, they're able to use some slightly smaller components. It follows a pretty similar trend, really. I think it's all based on the same type of circuitry. We've got our input um, supply here. We've got some uh, 200 volt capacitors this time because this one is um, rated for a higher voltage, 330 microfarads. And similarly the same at the top here. Here's our big inductor. And then we've just got a, um, a single uh, MOSFET here and a couple of diodes. Not much else to say really. So instead of the circuitry which was providing our isolated interface for the IS485, They've actually gone for a complete riser board assembly. So this has got one of those isolated DC to DC converter modules already on it. Uh, and then we've got our isolation for the actual data signals and that just goes straight down to the output terminal. So all of the IS485 stuff is actually on this board. Again, we've got our NRF24L01 2.4 gigahertz uh, transceiver, the same DC to DC converter for providing the logic supply, the same STM32. And uh, yeah, not a great deal else on there. Um, we have got some fairly chunky sense resistors here. These are formed with some copper wire. Again, three in each case. And uh, the airflow across here should keep those cool. Not much else on the underside other than some big chunky tracks, but I think, uh, you know, this one looks a little bit tidier but I think uh, the reduction in current carrying capability means that uh, we don't have quite so much faff associated with getting the current across the board. Right, so here's the test setup. We've got the Fluke 87 reading the output voltage. We've got the clamp meter here measuring the current, uh, just because the current's a bit higher than any of the meters that I've got that can measure directly. And then we're going to control it with the little handheld module. Now this is pretty straightforward to use, basically, you can see the little red man there, that's with the power off. Press OK, and that turns on the output, and you can see it's reading about one volt there, one volt here. Then if we want to actually change the voltage, we can use the arrows to determine which digit we're going to change. So we can use the knob here and change that all quite straightforwardly. Similarly, if we want to change the current, we can press the amps button and then dial the current up and down. It has detected that it's the 8920 that it's connected to, so it knows the maximum current here is 20 amps. So we'll leave it at 20 volts and 20 amps. We've got the DC load connected to this. We are turned on, as you can see. So we'll start drawing some current. So this should be 1 amp, 2 amps. That's 10 amps, and that's actually uh, 200 watts now. And this is still bang on 20 volts, 15 amps, 298 watts according to the DC load. Still no problem, really good in terms of regulation. 19 amps, 376 watts, still bang on in terms of the output voltage. And the maximum, 20 amps. And we're reading uh, exactly fine. So now if we start to decrease the current limit, 
yeah that's all working properly so it's decreased the current to 15 amps here if we decrease that further 5 amps 5 amps and it's decreased the voltage in the way that it needs to in order to get 5 amps through the load Right, so I've connected up the larger power supply. This one's rated for 50 amps, and you can see the remote control has automatically detected this is the 8650, and therefore it's changed the settings so that we can increase the current limit. Now, my AC to DC power converter can't output 50 amps, but you can see that we can set the current limit to 50. And um, this actual remote control can control multiple power supplies at once, it would appear. So you can give them an address, uh, they're currently both set to address one, but you can change the address on these and then use the same remote to control lots of different power supplies. Um, when you do set the output voltage to something higher than the incoming, it just sort of does its best. So here you can see I'm setting it to 30, but with our 24 volt incoming supply, we can only set it to 24.18. But uh, let's set it to the original 20 volts. The output is already on. So we can turn on the DC load. This should be set to 5 amps. And you can see here actually uh, this thing's reading it as 4.99 amps, almost 100 watts. Let's increase that further. 10 amps, about 200 watts. 15 amps, 319. So there's our 20 amps, 399 watts. So we're at the absolute maximum for the DC load as well. And we're sitting really well, so the regulation is absolutely spot on. Right, so we've got the Fluke 289 hooked up to the output. It's also measuring the AC component, but I think this has a low-pass filter, so we probably won't see the switching noise. So we've also got the MUS tool connected up to have a look at the noise. Now, with no load, you basically get hardly any switching noise at all. Bear in mind that we're also going to be seeing some noise coming back from the DC load in the way that that draws power. So at 10 amps... We can actually read about sort of one one volt peak to peak in terms of noise. Frequency appears to be at about 100 kilohertz. So that ties in with switching frequency from something. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the DC load or the power supply. Uh, and at 20 amps, we don't really see a huge increase in that switching noise. Now, this isn't really a surprise to me. I don't think this is designed to be sort of a precision power supply in any way. It's designed to power heavy loads. Uh, but certainly the performance doesn't seem to be too bad in terms of the regulation. So that's a little look at these Juntek DC to DC converter units and the little remote control. Now overall I think these aren't too bad in terms of the quality. Uh, at the price point you're getting pretty much uh, the kind of performance that you'd expect. They're not precision power supplies, so they're not going to replace your benchtop power supplies, but I think these do have a place in the market. It doesn't necessarily mean that you should go out and buy one of these. I think you'll know if you need something like this in your life. It's probably not going to be suitable for general bench use. But I'll put a link to the AliExpress listings for these in the description down below. If you've got any thoughts or anything, leave them in the comments down below. And until next time, thanks for watching.